Wahnsinn. Happy Friday and oh, hold on everybody cover your ears while we do the short person adjustment. There we go. Happy Friday and welcome to the Rotary Club of Brentwood. We are going to start today with invocation led by Sana Robinson and then Linus is going to lead us in the pledge and four way test. Sana, here you are. Please bow your head with me. Father God, we gather here as friends, fellow servants, and your children. We're grateful for the opportunity to meet weekly here for fellowship, and we ask your blessings upon this club, its missions, its members, and their families. Today, we pray for our members with challenges. We uh, just learned that Dr. Jean Harmon is currently hospitalized and unresponsive, and we are with his family. Our prayers are with his family as they navigate the uh, challenges of facing Dr. Harmon right now. Our prayers are also with those who are recovering, Harold Fogelberg, Jason Cook, Jared Tanksley, and Sarah Johnson, who continue to recover from their surgeries. We also ask that your continued care and comfort be with the family of Dr. Rick Finke, his wife, Janet, and his son, Doug, as they grieve his recent loss. We also have ongoing needs for our members, Bill McCarthy and Leon Partain, who we remember weekly. Please be with this club this week as we go out into the world and help us make an impact on others. Help us to live the four-way test in every interaction we have with others. We ask all of this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please face the flag and join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance. Stands one nation, and now the four way test of the things that we think, say, or do. First, second, third, fourth. Okay, now our club secretary is going to introduce guests and visiting Rotarians. Hello, everybody. We want Hello. you to hear who our guests are. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. We've got quite a few visitors today. Uh, Jennifer Bourne is going to introduce her first visit. There's lots, of, there's lots of Jennifers, but I'm the Ruane one. I brought my good friend, Bridget Powers. They have just relocated from, everybody gets one guess? <laughs> she is an orthodontist. She brought with her a husband and three children, and we we were neighbors there. So our children have grown up together. So I'm really excited. Uh, to Listen have up, my everybody, friend, please, to have my friend here in Middle Tennessee with me. Okay, no talking, kids, while we introduce our guests. <laughs> Drew, where did you go? There you go. Drew's got a guest. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I've got Zachariah Sanders, who uh, recently joined Legends Bank. Um, you, you're supposed to keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. So we are competitors <laughs> in case you weren't making that connection. I'm also a banker. Uh, but Zachariah and I used to work together at uh, First Horizon Bank. And so um, he is a prospective member, and I'm glad to have him here with us today. Awesome. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. Jeff Brown's got a guest. I'd like to have you all meet Amber Nelson. Amber is the uh, guidance counselor at John Overton High School in their Health Sciences Academy. And she has agreed to become the faculty sponsor for the John Overton Interact Club for next year. <laughs> very, very important ally of ours. Welcome, welcome. And Jay Evans has a guest. Well, I'm happy to introduce to you Mr. Charles Booth, who is a privileged new community relations director. Awesome. 
We stole him from Austin P University where he was the communications director and had been with their communications department for almost 15 years. So we're very happy to have Charles on board. You're already seeing some of his good work. If you follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, like I know you all do, uh, you're already seeing his authorship of some really good product. So thank you. And many of you know Rebecca Nunley. She has now turned in her new member application to be a member of Rotary. Good to have you, Rebecca. That is it outside of our speaker. And uh, all yours, Jane. Awesome. Uh, now we're going to have a special Happy Bucks led by Laura True. Today's Happy Bucks proceeds are going to go to TBCH graduating senior Braxton. Braxton has been, um, uh, is a sibling group that has lived on the campus for the last four years, and he is the only graduate this year. Um, they have put a list together to help get him set up as he goes off to college and opens a new apartment. So anything that we get today in Happy Bucks is going to go toward that. So. Tengo cinco dólares para el cinco de mayo. Viva México. I'd like to welcome our, our, our new guest, our new friend from California, and remind her that Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, was voted Realtor of the Year in Tennessee last year. <laughs> I, have five, uh, I have five unhappy bucks, probably uh, for the five hours I'll spend in traffic going down to East Nashville to mix uh, Matt magnet school this afternoon for my son's five o'clock band concert right in all the traffic for taylor swift so uh pray for me yeah no one wants mic time today y'all no one wants the microphone, but no, lots of people want to help Braxton. It's for Braxton, and thank you and Roger Greenup also for chairing the Tennessee Baptist Children Home all year long. We're very thankful. That's right. Um, happy Bucks. I never do this, but we had an awesome time at casino night and super excited. So if you missed it, maybe we'll do it again next year. But if you were able to come, so glad and we had a wonderful time. Yeah. <laughs> My wife and I just returned from a, about a month overseas. And what I wanted to say is that sometimes you have to leave home in order to appreciate home. And so I appreciate being back. Appreciate all you guys. So thank you. Putting some money in. Um, this will be the last meeting that we will have our esteemed mayor with us. So I would like to thank Ray for the four years he's done serving our city. This is a, um, for Braxton. And then a quick update on golf. We had a slow week except for Michelle, who sold two sponsorships this week. So awesome. yay, hi, Michelle. Everybody needs to follow that lead, okay? Thank you. Okay, and I have a golf one. Um, my Agape Golf Tournament was this past Monday. And thanks to some of you in this room who contributed to this, we raised $280,000. Good grief. That is insane. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer, great job on the uh, gambling night. And uh, Jane, i throw a red flag on that uh, all-time winner, Devin. <laughs> oh my. you know i'm just i'm just saying he did not have the most money so um uh, you question. accusing rotarian of cheating uh no i'm just saying you were misled in that so <laughs> seriously yeah. right, thanks. awesome thank you
So now um, we will, you've heard a little bit about Casino Night. I wanted to show those of you who were unable to be there a few pictures of all the fun that you missed. Lots of fun. And we want to thank Curry and Nelson Andrews for the use of their dealership as the venue. It was the perfect venue. We had tons of fun. It was, uh, we did it on a low budget. And I think it turned out just as well as any of our other uh, socials where we, you know, pay for the food and all that stuff. We did uh, food and Buffalo Wild Wings. And once again, Buffalo Wild Wings gave us a great deal when we um, catered dinners for the Tennessee Baptist Children's Home. And they wanted to give us big discounts for this Rotary event too. So please uh, go to Buffalo Wild Wings and give them your business because they seem to be very uh, a great company and just very willing to give back to the community. Cool Springs. Yep, absolutely. So that was casino night. Come next time if you didn't make it this one because it was really fun. Uh, let's see. Waverly. I don't see Hunter here, but our next Waverly food distribution will be on June 3rd. So please put that on your calendars now. We'll, uh, you know, be sending out more information and reminding you, but go ahead and log that date as, go ahead and put that on your calendar. Finally, district conference, you've gotten a couple of emails to RSVP for the district conference lunch. The deadline for RSVPs is next Friday, the 12th, and then the conference will be the following Friday, the 19th. So please uh, put that on your calendar as well. And with that, I will ask Sybil to introduce our speaker for today. Okay. As some of you may know, I grew up on a farm in Western New York. So I am particularly thrilled and honored to have today's speaker with us. Stephanie Nash is a fourth generation dairy farmer from Tennessee. Her family originated out of central California, but in 2013, decided to move their dairy to Tennessee due to regulations, drought, and hardships in California agriculture. Stephanie believes the family farmers and ranchers are the backbone of this country and their land and water rights must be protected. Through digital media outlets, countless appearances on national news channels, and PBS Emmy-nominated documentaries, Stephanie has created a large platform for her advocacy and continues to educate Americans on how we can sustain our food supply. Stephanie not only speaks for her family farm, but advocates for family farmers and ranchers through her YouTube series called The Life of a Farmer. Stephanie is a true American patriot, fighting for our food security and the future of American grown here in the United States. Please join me in welcoming Stephanie Nash. <laughs> the wireless mic, does it work behind me? Can I use that? Okay. Yeah, Check one, two. There we go. I cannot stand still. That's why I was like, <laughs> a wireless mic is great. Um, so again, Sybil, thank you so much. Uh, PBS, uh, Jeff actually texted me three days ago. So it's funny that you caught on to that about the Emmy nomination for our episode. It was um, an episode I got to be in for women in agriculture across the United States. Um, me and Jeff have worked together for the past year to bring content to the American people uh, to talk about agriculture and things that are facing our country. So um, I'll kind of start off with um, about me. Uh, again, you know, Sybil introduced me. We came from California. We were um, in the largest agriculture county in the United States, uh, San Joaquin Valley, um, that produces over 400 uh, commodities. Um, they also are really big on the dairy industry. Uh, it is the number one, two, 
them and almonds go back and forth in California. It's a billion dollar industry. And so for us to leave was a very big decision because we had grown up in California. My dad was on the board. He actually represented the state um, when Governor Schwarzenegger was in office. So it was a really cool time for people to be visiting us from Sacramento and us educating on the dairy industry. So I have a long history of um, a man being in my life that has represented agriculture very well. Um, so, you know, in 2008, 2009, uh, we saw a collapse, not only in the economy, but we saw a collapse with agriculture in California. And so we as a family decided to start looking around. We looked in Texas. We said, you know, we come from a state that struggles with water already. We don't want to go to another one that has droughts. Um, so Texas was out pretty, pretty aggressively, pretty quickly. Uh, we looked in states like South Dakota, and my mom said it is too cold up there. So... <laughs> She, uh, there's a lot of good dairies that actually moved up there between 2009 and 2013 because the governor was like open doors. Uh, but you know, in the end, we knew we wanted to open our own business and bring education to a state, and we needed a bigger city to do that. And so, um, if you guys don't know, Shelbyville is walking horse country um, of the world. And so, uh, at the time, that property was a walking horse farm. And a construction guy down in Florida said, okay, my daughter's graduating. I don't need the land anymore. And so we came in and swooped it up at a good time in 2013 when things were still cheap around here. Um, and we built a brand new dairy. Um, we got the opportunity to kind of build a viewing room. So if you come to our dairy, you get to see the milking parlor and how we take care of our cattle. Um, and then in 2020, uh, we open the creamery. So we make our own ice cream. We make our own cheese. You can come for lunch and dinner um, and have a lot of great products from our farm. Um, and then, you know, uh, 2020 was also the year, well, I would say 2019, but it was also the year that I really started advocating. Um, I saw a need in our country for truth. Um, my dad is 64. And the average age of a farmer is 65. So when you look at our future, it's not looking so great in the food security um, realm of American grown. It's really sad to know that most of these farmers and ranchers have kind of given up. And I never use the phrase, well, you should just you're, you should just keep your land. You know, there's a lot of people out there. That, that like to tell us how to do our jobs of not selling land to construction companies, you know, selling out on foreclosures. They don't know half of it. Um, when you have kids and you're 65 and you're two, three million dollars in debt and a construction company offers you that and you can get out of debt. Um, at this point, the country is not supporting family farmers or ranchers, so I don't blame them, honestly. Um, and so what I have seen across our country is a lot of money but a lot of money not going into sustaining our food supply. Uh, Montana is a great example. Montana got popular after the show Yellowstone and uh, not trying to hate if you have a house over there, but what has happened in our country is we have built on land that is not only great for cattle and great for crops, but we build on land and we make it more expensive for Farmer John down the road to buy for future, okay? Um, Tennessee, we are doing an awful job. Okay, I'm just going to be honest. Uh, here's the reason why I separate myself and I have for the last three years. I don't have sponsorships within agriculture companies because I call people out of not doing the right job. Okay, I, I'm 30 years old. I want our dairy farm to last for a lifetime and for my kids eventually. And if we don't start being honest with our food supply, we're going to be getting it from China. I'm just going to tell you that right now. Okay. Uh, last year alone, increase from Mexico was 12% on beef. Increase from Brazil was 57%. You know why it's 57%? Because JBS is Brazilian owned, okay? So if we think about Big Corp and what is happening in our country and how the USDA is structured to help struggling farmers, okay? That's what they're saying now. Uh, when they open these programs, what is happening is they're targeting certain farmers and ranchers and certain commodities 
to make a, a profit for themselves. It's not about the small family farm or rancher, and it's not helping our country either. It's, it's really hurting the next generation. Kids nowadays, no offense, are lazy, okay? I have three boys that work for me. Their dads work for my dad. And I have to teach them the quality, which is hard work in this country to earn a dollar, okay? Because at school, they're not learning it. Um, and lately, I've seen a lot of people that, especially anywhere from age 12 to 19, they just think their food comes from the grocery store. Because we're about two to three generations removed from agriculture and coming from California, being in 4-H and FFA, Middle Tennessee doesn't really have tons of opportunities for programs with agriculture, okay? There's a couple schools that have FFA programs, but there's no real sense of urgency for us to teach our kids about agriculture. And I think that's what's missing here in Tennessee. I also think there's a lot of choices that we make now because we want Nashville to grow, which is great, okay? I love it for the creamery and for educating Tennessee. But when it comes to other farmers, ranchers trying to find more land to keep up with feed prices and farm costs and overall inputs, it's really hurting our ranching community. And we're kind of leaving them behind, even though they've been here longer than most people moving in. Um, and so I created this platform for honesty. Um, I tell people, you're either with me and you want to listen. I mean, you're going to have your own opinion, yes. Um, but, you know, moving from California gave me a lot of perspective. It gave me a chance to be honest with Americans. It gave me a chance to create a platform that's not about followers, that's not about money, that's not about just saying what I need to say to get ahead. It's a platform of truth. It's a platform to educate the next generation. It's a platform to save our food supply here in America. And it's a platform to fight against big corporations that are pretty much stealing from our family farmers and ranchers, okay? The great example, milk right now in the grocery store. And I'm not talking about the plant-based stuff. I'm talking about real milk that my cows produce. Two, it's 98 to $4. And my, our farm got paid less last two months. How does that happen? Because they're being selfish. I mean, you look at JBS, Tyson, Cargill, $71 billion last year in marginal profits. Oh, it wasn't because of inflation. We wouldn't do that to the American people. So how do we fix this? The biggest thing that I have been fighting with um, and, and trying to get people to see is we need more processing plants. If we're going to start here in Tennessee, we have to invest into our food. And that starts with more processing plants working with small family farmers and ranchers, paying them what they need to survive, okay? Um, that's the biggest part. When you take out big corporations and big processing plants, not only do you have more affordable product, but you have farmers and ranchers that you can trust and you know exactly where your food is coming from. And I've told a lot of groups this. I'm just going to tell you now, farmers and ranchers don't have the capital to do this. The USD right now doesn't want to do it. Okay, they came out the last two years, all they say, oh, they want to help farmers and ranchers or disadvantaged farmers and ranchers. There's no program out there that is benefiting our own processing plant. I have a friend in Texas, okay, really good friend of mine. They opened two years ago. The USDA has been on their butt for the last two years because it doesn't fit their agenda. It doesn't fit this big old pretty much financial need that they need to fill because they've been paying us what they think that we should get paid, not what we need to get paid. And so it's just a lot of things. So that's the first thing I think. I think establishing education in Tennessee, which I do. I do farm camp in the summer because I care about kids and I care about their future. I care about them having more time on the farm than sitting in front of the TV playing video games, okay? Video games aren't bad, but we're teaching our kids it's okay to sit at home all day. It's okay to not know where our food is coming from. And it's okay to get your education off Google instead of an actual farmer and rancher. And that's what's missing. We're missing the opportunity to support farmers and ranchers here in Tennessee that have programs. I mean, I, I think we need to have a lot more schools with FFA. I get to speak at Page on Monday, Page Middle School. Um, and my friend also is the agriculture teacher at Page High School. Um, they're doing something there. There's a lot of kids in that classroom that don't even know what agriculture is. 
Some of them don't even care. And the best part is when I came to speak, the teacher was like, he has never asked a question all semester long. And he asked me two questions. When you bring people from the outside that they can relate with, I'm not that old still, so I can connect with children, you open them up to an avenue to have hope for their future. Not only that, I'm big on the news. I love it, okay? This is something that I'm really excited about. It has opened a lot of doors, and it's not just me on the news. If they call me, they called me the other day, hey, we want a chicken farmer. I know who to get on the news. Hey, we wanted somebody to talk about you know, China exports, imports, I know somebody. So I've become an avenue for farmers and ranchers to get on platforms like these and, and be truthful. And that's important because in a world full of opinions, and we have a lot of them, we're missing the truth behind our food. It's just what it is. Um, one thing that I'm also really passionate about in agriculture, which I think has swayed consumers and scared us in America is labeling. Labeling can be so misleading, okay? I am a conventional farmer. Does that mean I add antibiotics or added hormones or whatever you wanna make up in your mind to my product? No. Are we missing the point of a label? Absolutely. Any big corporation can slap natural non-GMO on a label on food. There's only three practices out of like hundreds that you have to pass to be non-GMO. Okay, so if you're going to Whole Foods because you think you're saving the planet, think again. I mean, it's just the truth, okay? And I told my last group, it's not a mean thing, I'm just being honest. All of our food is tested, especially if it's here in Tennessee and has PICT in. It has PICT in on it, you know what's going here. And if you want to learn more, go to the farm and educate yourself from them. In 2015, they took off country of origin. That was the biggest mistake our country made. Because remember those numbers I said a couple minutes ago? How Brazil has grown 57% to our food supply? That's gross. We should know about that. And you know why they took it off in 2015? Because they knew that they were going to crush family farmers and ranchers with regulations and then we're gonna take over the market. And that's exactly what happened, and that's why we're here today. Because farmers and ranchers are being missed, because the news tells us that we're killing the planet, but we have the highest regulations, the highest standards, and some of the best people in the best industry that I've ever been a part of. We roll over backwards for consumers because they want that something on the label or because the USDA is behind our shoulders because climate change initiative is so big right now and because they don't want to point fingers at private, private jets or energy infrastructure. And again, I'm not attacking you if you're in those industries. But if you're gonna continue to attack our industry, I'm gonna call you out on what you're doing in yours. And that's why my platform has grown because truckers, small business people, and true patriot Americans want to know what I do and what I stand for, and debunk regulations and climate change initiatives that kill off our industry. Because I'm not gonna sugarcoat a conversation. I never have. My dad's like, you have the biggest personality. I said, well, I watched you grow up going to hearings in Sacramento. I watched you fight. Where do you think I get it from? You were on boards eight or 10 at a time. Because California continued to attack us because activists poured milk and fake blood in Chick-fil-A because they thought they were doing something big. I went to Fresno State for three years until I transferred to UT Knoxville. Once every semester they had Activist Day. Activist Day was PETA, Humane Society, coming with their tablets and showing videos from the 90s of a slaughter plant that had a down cow. You know what a down cow is? It's, it doesn't look good to you because you don't know what it is. A down cow means she might have low calcium. She might have hurt her leg. Those cows are anywhere from 1,500 pounds to 2,300 pounds, and we have to lift them with a tractor. Does that mean it's inhumane? No. But you don't know that because PETA puts it out there and makes it seem like we're the bad guys and we're inhumane. 
PETA gets money from you and they have a slaughter plant for animals because they cannot keep every cat and dog safe. And I've learned that. Her CEO makes a million dollars. Oh, $19 a month. Oh, you're giving back to animals. That's for sure. No, they have lied for the past 10 years. And because I called them out, I get canceled. Luckily, the activists haven't really found me, but they found my friend, Iowa Dairy Farmer. He's big on TikTok and on Facebook. And he talks about practices that we do in the dairy industry. But there's a lot of stuff that goes on. And I think for, for the main reason of why people sometimes don't want me to talk in front of big agriculture groups is because there's been this, there's been this mis miscommunication for the past five years. I mean, I even went to um, nanotechnology, it's aqua yield. And uh, after I spoke, one person was like, why did you bring her? She's against what we're doing. And he said, no, she's not against what we're doing. She's just trying to make our platform better. So we're not attacking the agriculture community through climate change, through labels and teaching you know, our investors and our followers that agriculture is bad because it's not. And so that's what I do along here. We talked about the Netherlands, how farmers were protesting against their government. Love it. I would love to go over there and do stories because I think that's great. We talked about regulations. That was, I think, one of my first inter interviews. Um, and then Tucker's my man. You know, he he's had me on about four times. I love talking on his platform. Um, and I think he get, he gives an opportunity for me and other farmers or ranchers to speak up about our operations. So I'm really grateful for that. There's another one. This one was great. So we want to talk about, yeah, climate change. Like, this is crazy, okay? They want to put masks on cows to cut emissions. Like, this is the stuff we're dealing with, okay? <laughs> and the last, like, I would say 10 years, it has opened a market for alternatives. And why I think this is dangerous, number one, you're not investing in it. Alternatives are invested with Bill Gates, and with people like Singapore and China, and they put stuff out there to make you believe that agriculture is bad and their product is gonna save the world. It's made in a lab, y'all. I'm just gonna let you know that. It's made in a lab, and I understand lactose intolerant. I understand health issues, and that's your health choices. But don't buy it, again, because you think you're saving the planet. I have a lot of vegans and vegetarians that follow me that believe in agriculture, but because of health reasons, they can't eat it. I understand, okay? But this one was crazy. My dad was trying to put the mask on and the cow was like fighting it and like ripping it off. So obviously that's a bad idea. So if you guys wanna watch it, um, you just need to type in Stephanie Nash, Tucker Carlson, they'll all come up. Um, this is what I'm talking about, okay? So on TV, has anybody seen Cowspiracy on Netflix? Has anybody watched that yet? No? Okay, watch it and then put yourself in my shoes. That is so misleading. It's environmentalists. It's people on the plant-based agenda. If you really wanted to have an honest opinion, you would have put more farmers in, in on it and let them talk about their stewardship because they just, they had one farmer rancher on there. Okay, grass-fed, whatever. And he was like, really putting them in a corner, not letting them explain. And that's what these people do to us. They look at our numbers, they look at how many cows we have or how much crop, how, how much land we have, how much water use, you know, we're using. They don't look at the end product. That's the problem. They don't look at the end product. They just look at numbers. And so I'm like, oh, you want to look at numbers, huh? So 2020, it's a little behind, but this is the closest I could get. You know, agriculture, greenhouse gases is under everything. It's under everything. So when I go to our conservation meeting this past February, and they want to force nutrient management programs on farms, I have a problem with that. Because they're making everybody's life easier in Tennessee except for farmers and ranchers. It's the truth. I'm just being honest. Okay? They're building and building and building. And, you know, me and my dad want to go to a sale tomorrow, 20,000 an acre. Ridiculous. Great money for the construction company. Again, I'm not hating on you. 
I'm just saying, how can we work together to make sure the million point two of agricultural land that's already gone is not another million point two in three years? Because that processing plant is something I'm dreaming of, something I wanna work on with investors to continue to say, hey, we care about Tennessee agriculture. We care about the farmers and ranchers that are producing and providing. One example of my advocacy, again, I'm not a quiet person. I'm gonna be honest because I live this life. Jack Daniels, everybody knows Jack Daniels, Lynchburg, Tennessee. They wanted to rip away a program for farmers to get slop for their cows, to create 10 jobs, to bring energy into houses in Lynchburg, 10 jobs. They're cutting off 150 farmers from cheap feed that need that to stay in business. That's the kind of world we live in because we're looking at the sustainability for 10 jobs and we're cutting off our farmers and ranchers that are actually feeding us. If you're gonna bring numbers to a project, you better bring better numbers than 10 jobs. So I called them out on it and guess what? They didn't cancel the program because they don't like to be called out. And 30% of people that work at Jack Daniels are farmers and ranchers. I mean, you have to look at the people. If you have a small business, look at the people. Ask them about their life. I'm sure you guys have some hobby farmers that have beef cattle. Maybe some of you do too, okay? So that was a big thing for me. Um, one last thing that I'll talk about and then I'll, I'll ask questions because I know I only have so much time. Again, social media. This is something why I started on TikTok and YouTube and Facebook in the first place is because people are clicking on these links. There's Cowspiracy. They're clicking on these links and they're believing it. New York Times is my biggest enemy with articles and news. They lie. And let me just tell you, not trying to be mean, but it's a guy living in New York City in a condo that's never even stepped foot on a farm and he's writing an article about me. Sorry, <laughs> I'm going to call you out because they get these numbers from scientists with an agenda. I'm just gonna tell you right now, the Green New Deal is killing us in the farming and ranching community because what the USDA is doing now is they're listening to this Green New Deal and they're saying what we can and cannot do. That's not farming, that's control. And no farmer at 65 wants to keep farming with the USDA looking over their shoulder. Me and Ben Neal, if you guys want some local beef, go to Spring Hill, Light Hill Meats. Him and Ben, or Lauren and Ben, we talk all the time about it. He has left some organizations because all they fight for is regulations, conservation easements, and higher costs for us. I have left so many agriculture groups because I'm sick and tired of this agenda. I call the labeling system broken and they don't want to do business with me because I'm actually, it's, it's the truth. You wanna know where your food comes from? Go to a family farm or rancher and buy products there. That's the only way you're gonna know now. You don't know if it's coming from another country because we took the origin off. So that's something we have to think about moving forward in Tennessee. Can we work together to sustain our land and water availability? Can we protect Tennessee against WOTUS that has now been passed? It's so vague. If you have private land, you better get ready because they want to take your water. Just like Colorado governor took the water from Colorado, it is dry desert in Colorado. You cannot keep animals alive without water. And you can't actually buy your land and think that you want to do something with it if the government's going to come on and tell you what to do with it. We have to do better. We just have to. And I don't know the perfect answer. I know John Rose is a great congressman here in Tennessee. He's got a bee farm. I trust him. And we need to work with people like that up in Washington, D.C. to protect Tennessee. Governor Lee goes to almost every fair. And so I, I'm really you know, passionate about it. But I think more farmers and ranchers, in my opinion, need to be in office, city council, need to be in schools, teaching our kids about agriculture. And I don't teach kids about this. I teach them how I milk my cows, how I feed my calves. I have little cute videos. They love it, but they're little, they're learning. You're grown, you can make decisions. 
So that's why we're here today, just to talk about our culture, what is going on in Tennessee, what's going around the country, um, and how I can help. Yeah, how I can help. So if you guys have questions, I'll take those. Those are my best friend's twins. They are so cute. So I use them for my publicity at the, at the creamery. <laughs> questions from anybody? Appreciate your talk. Uh, is it true Gates and China are buying a lot of farmland? And if so, why? So, yes, actually. Um, Bill Gates has, has uh, grown significantly. China is not growing as fast as I think they will. I think, you know, we as USDA, not we, not USDA, used to, when China or other countries would buy land, you would have to fill out paperwork of why you were using land. And that's gone away. And that scares me because what are they investing into? I mean, if you look at the land that Bill Gates has bought in China, it's strategic. Okay. They want the water rights. They're going into communities that are already very agriculture based. I mean, a great example is I talked to a farmer the other day in Arkansas. Uh, Bill Gates under a New Jersey company bought about 2,000 acres. And so while that doesn't seem like a lot, he's buying 2,000 here, 10,000 here, 15,000 here, 100,000 there. And it's going to add up. And on top of that, you know, our government has made it, and I'm not saying anybody specific, but our government overall wants more land and wants to work with the Bureau of Land Management to have more land. But what is happening is they're not farming it. They're just buying it. And so that's a problem moving forward. If, if the government wants to have control of our land and our water, then they should be hiring farmers and ranchers to farm that land for our food supply. And that's just not happening. So, I mean, the scariest thing for me with Bill Gates is he wants to invest in plant-based and bring it here and partner with Singapore. That's the biggest thing that I'm, I'm scared for because if we start to invest more into plant-based, it gives more opportunity for heavier regulations on the agriculture side is how I feel about it as a farmer rancher. And what I've seen growing up in the dairy industry, I mean, we have lost 45,000 dairy farms since 2003 to now, and we're under 24,000, which is disgusting to me. It's just too much. Yeah. Say, say those numbers again. So from 2003 to now, we've lost over 45,000 dairy farms. And I would say out of the 24,000 left, you're going to have a lot of big corporations or you're having families um, come together to make multiple dairies, but it's under one name to survive is what is happening. Uh, we milk 1,200 cows, so we're actually pretty small from the average. Yeah. Um, I am not a big fan of ice cream, but I like your creamery so well that I drove my in-laws 40 miles down to Shelbyville so that they could taste the finest ice cream I'd ever experienced. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm going to tell my brother that because he'll like grin ear to ear. My brother is um the introvert of the family, so... <laughs> He loves hearing when I go to these events and he's like, hey, they love your ice cream. He's like, really? <laughs> so my question is, what can people like us who are just suburban consumers do to help support the message that you're trying to convey? Yeah. So, you know, something that I really want to do this year um, is to get into more schools. Um, I have been Dairy Princess in California. That's the first photo. So if you don't know much, much about the Dairy Princess program. Um, I went through training with other dairy princesses across California, and we learned how to teach kids about agriculture. And I would love to get into more schools. That would be number one. So if you do have children or grandchildren um, that I can connect with, um, I bring like a little board and the Dairy Alliance sends me coloring books and like cow signs that they can put over their face. They have eyes in them, so they're really cute. But just to like teach them about what I do. Um, that's a big thing. Um, you know, I, I really do have a passion for teaching kids and I love it, even though, um, farm camp is sometimes insane, <laughs> but it's really fun. And I think the second thing is to, I would really love to build a website. Pick tea and has one right now, but I don't think it stops there. I would really love to build a website where Tennessee residents can go and they can buy small business, locally grown business, um, and then also have videos. So like if they have a page, you can get to know their their operation, their family business. And so I think that's big and something that I think we're missing. You know, I talked about it with Tennessee Agriculture a couple of years ago, uh, but because of my platform, you know, you know how it goes. 
Um, but I think that would be a, a really beneficial thing to do here in Tennessee is have a website and promote it through Pick TN and then tell the stories of agriculture. But you can buy local. There's so many. I mean, Tennessee, I've never seen a state have so many farmers markets. We have a lot. So just go learn about your farm, farmer rancher. You guys will learn a lot. Anybody else? Questions? How many of us grew up on a farm or worked on a farm? What's your experience with those I just wanted to put in a plug for the creamery. Uh, I'm in Shelbyville three to five times a month. And if there's ever anybody in the car with me, and you guys are open, we're stopping by because yeah. there's fabulous ice cream. Your drive down there is going to be one of the most beautiful scenic drives through the middle Tennessee countryside. It is gorgeous. And we, when you get there, it is such a warm family atmosphere. If you go on the weekends, there's tons of people there. Everybody from all around comes there to spend an afternoon and enjoy the picnic tables. The kids are playing and having fun. It's a great thing you guys built there just since 2013, right? Yeah. So, well, the 2013 was the dairy, but 2020 was the creamery. Wow. Yeah. And then we're putting in a playground in July as well. So something for the kids. Yeah. So... So just a, just a couple. Is this on? Yep. Yeah. So I did mention that I grew up. And I'm not, I mean, I am intimately familiar with the struggle and the challenges. And um, what you scrape the surface. I mean, there's so much we could talk about. But one thing I saw you in an interview with um, on Elkip, oh, yeah. and the topic came up. Uh, the high incidence of suicide. I'm my family. I'm just saying high incidence of uh, suicide among farmers in the uptick, and you know mental illness that has occurred over you know recent. Is that anything you can address? Yeah, actually. So I'm part of a group. Um, there's a couple women that come from all over the United States that um, I got involved with a year ago. And so we actually promote the mental illness with um, a hotline that they can call. It's mainly in Texas um, under the Ag Commissioner, Sid Miller. Um, but there's a lot of hotlines out there that we have been trying to express to farmers and ranchers because a lot of people, I mean, Tennessee, you're not too far um, from cities, but in other communities and places like Montana, I mean, I can drive two and a half hours to get to my friend's ranch. It takes forever. Um, but they just don't have the hope that they used to. We're actually the number one industry in mental illness now. Um, and so um, it's really sad to see, you know, our community struggling because, again, going back to the average age of 65, um, we, we don't have many representatives out there that actually want to take on the subject because it's so broad. I mean, when you're fighting against... Um, other industries, it feels like there's one topic, but with agriculture, there's so many different avenues that we're facing right now. It's a lot of time. It's a lot of energy. Um, and so sometimes we just feel like we get left behind in the conversation. And, um, you know, there's been a lot of, a lot of agriculture kids my age starting to speak up about that. Um, and I think that's something Tennessee can do better. It's not just showing up. It's actually going to the meetings you know, I just partnered with somebody to get a bill because if you don't know, the FDA wants to change our breakfast and lunch programs for our kids. Um, so they're pretty much trying to implement bad food into our kids' education. Um, so I would like to have something written up for 2024 to protect our state from that because it's been in office, like FDA programs have been the same since 1956. So why are they changing it now? Because they want your kids to get onto this plant-based agenda. That's scary. Like, I'm not going to not fight for milk in schools and for healthy options. Like, if you haven't seen Lucky Charms is in like the 10, top 10, like you cannot convince me that Lucky Charms is healthier than a glass of milk. And so that's what they're trying to do now. They're trying to get into schools. And so that's actually something I'm working on. If you guys wanna be a part of it, um, you know, I, <laughs> I'm not a politician, I'm a farmer. But I would love to write something for Tennessee to protect our kids from the FDA changing that. That's that's pretty big. So going to mental illness, you know, it's 
it's really sad to see, you know, we just lost our um, truck driver from mental illness a couple months ago. So it's real, it's happening. And um, it's really scary that we can't comfort those people, you know. Just one other thing. Yeah. I, I left uh, New York in 82, I moved to California. Um, but I was home visiting my folks in 1997. And there was, a, I guess you'd call it a raid, maybe, um, on one of the biggest farms in our county. And they rounded up like 26 illegals, the migrant workers, and deported them. And that farm said they left at least 2 million crops on the fields because there was no labor to uh, pick the crops. Has there been any progress as far as labor and legalizing folks to come here and work? I'm so glad you went over that. Okay, so um, I am a Turning Point Agriculture Ambassador. Doesn't matter your beliefs. That's what they brought me on for. Um, so I actually got to talk about um, with a Hispanic channel about this because I think about immigration differently than probably all of this room, except for people that grew up on a farm. I'll, I'm just gonna tell you about George. George has been working for me for 17 years. Maria had their second child and moved two weeks later with us out of California. They just had their third child last year. We go to every quinceanera, every birthday party, um, you know, everything that we can get involved with our employees, we do. And so what I have seen in the last two years, I think it's really disgusting that our country, I'm trying to say this lightly, but I, I have a different approach. I know that, no offense, most, um, most people don't wanna work in agriculture. They don't find pride in it. They don't, they don't see the potential. And you know, Mexico has a lot of people that they train that are herdsmen, that are vets. And these people, take pride in that work. I mean, a great example is Margarita. She's been working for me for four years. She's 62 years old, the best woman I've ever met. She cooks me enchiladas and tamales all the time. And we would be nowhere without these families. We have a family that the two sons work there, the aunt, the son, the grandpa, there's five of them because they love cattle. They love their work. And what has happened in our country is we have made it harder on farmers and ranchers to bring in people with skills to work on a farm because all we see is the bad side. We see the border, we see um, you know, crime or whatever it might be. We don't see the people that actually give back to agriculture. I mean, look at California. I grew up in a 99% Hispanic city, Selma, California, and they love their work because not only did they get paid three to four times more than they would in Mexico, but because they were sending that money back to Mexico for their families. And so, there's a lot of things with programs. If you want to get somebody over here, it'll cost you minimum $3,500, minimum, for one worker. And I see that as a problem because they're putting us in a corner. If you can't have, I mean, I've hired like 20 white guys and they've all quit within two weeks. They don't want to work. I'm just going to be honest. You're, you're like, oh, they're taking jobs from us. Not in the agriculture world because they don't, they can't handle it. Okay, I can carry a 50 pound grain bag. I had a kid I had to, had to fire because he couldn't even pick it up. I mean, that's the reality that I'm living in. And so when I look at the, these programs, they're like, oh, well, if you want to get somebody over here, you can pay $10,000. No farm and ranch has $10,000 to get one person over here. I think we have an opportunity to work with people to get labor to where it needs to be in agriculture communities because that's a big thing. They take all of their workers, they have nobody to go into the fields or milk the cows or take care of the beef cattle in the snowstorm because most of you would not do that, okay? Back in February when it was like eight degrees, I was out there in my car heart. I slept out in maternity to make sure my babies were safe. That's the world I live in. And that's the sacrifice I make. So when you get your food, remember that during storms, we're not just sitting in our houses. And most of our workers aren't either. Margarita slept in the barn because of snowstorm. She wasn't able to drive. She was there the next morning helping me feed calves. That's the commitment they have. And so when you want to talk about immigration, I get really passionate about that because they're my family. We have had workers. I mean, Max, he's 94, still living in California. He couldn't move with us. But my dad paid for a mobile home for him to stay, him and his wife. I mean, that's the kind of relationship I've always had. 
with Hispanic culture. And I, I'll fight for that because I don't believe in all the nonsense on the news. I believe those people are very smart and they are the ones that are keeping agriculture alive here in the United States. So that's what I'm gonna say about that. Quick question, we only have a few minutes. <clears throat> Uh, what's it like moving a farm <laughs> from California to Tennessee with all that cattle and yeah. everybody? I can't imagine how many trucks you had. Yeah, so lots of trucks. <laughs> uh, we actually moved. So when I was at Fresno State, my job was to see who could transport because it was a two-day trip. They stopped in San Antonio on the way. And our cows go through something called a dry period, meaning they're all pregnant. They go off milk entirely. My dad at first was like, well, we can ship them. We can milk them. I was like, are you crazy? <laughs> so I was like, we need to dry them. Uh, so they all came dry. Only one had a calf and one died out of 957 that we moved. So I think that's pretty successful. Um, and, you know, the, the thing is when you move, California doesn't have humidity. They don't have rain. They don't have 30 to 70 in 24 hours. So <laughs> we've had to change a lot of things um, on our farm. And uh, I just, you know, it was crazy. Lots of trucks and lots of time, but we're here and we've been farming for 10 years. So we're really proud of that. Well, thank you guys. Thank you so much, Stephanie. We've got as a gift for you, a pen with our club logo on it. And we'll ask that you sign this book that teaches um, the rotary principles to elementary school age children, our club reads to them. And after you sign it, we'll tell them about your visit to our club. Um, one other quick reminder on Monday the 15th, that there will be another pop-up lunch in the parking lot of Five Guys, right, Jennifer Bourne, 15th? Not this Monday, but the next one is the next pop-up lunch if you want to show up and uh, have lunch with Rotarians. Uh, I think anything else for the good of Rotary? Anybody have anything else? Okay, we're adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Yeah.